Neil McClellan grew up in uh, Gatineau in the province of Quebec. And uh, he received his MFA in 2014 from the University of Victoria. Neil has won the prestigious Elizabeth Green Shields uh, Award in 2016 and 2020, enabling him to accomplish the body of work that he'll be discussing with you this afternoon. Uh, Neil has also a Bachelor's of Education and a Bachelor's of Music with Honours. Neil's here with us in the uh, gallery this afternoon, and we'll uh, welcome him right now. Neil, if you'd uh, come forward with us and... Uh... Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> Hello. So I'm, uh, I'm just going to start up a PowerPoint, uh, and share the screen here for a minute. All right. So Uh, so, I'm Neil McClellan. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, I just want to say a few things about myself as well. Uh, I received my uh, MFA in painting from the University of Victoria in 2014. I'm a sessional instructor there. Um, and also, uh, I teach at Vancouver Island School of Art. My wife and I live here in Victoria, and I have a studio in Chinatown. Um, so, place is place is a key theme in my work and a particular place that it, uh, that's been a starting point for the work in this show is uh, is very important and i it's, it's a place where i grew up so i thought i would uh, talk a little bit about that um, if you'll indulge me um, as was mentioned i grew up in the uh, in gatineau park uh, in quebec across the river from ottawa um, and the property has been in the family for a long time. My father was born there and raised there. Um, and, uh, and then he inherited the house and then I grew up there and my, uh, at certain times I, I moved back there. Um, and, uh, and my son grew up there, uh, for a number of years. So it's sort of intergenerationally been in the family. Um, a uh, long time ago, it used to be an apple orchard uh, when my father was young. And then, uh, and then when I was young, there were fields and cows and some chickens. And, uh, and uh, now the, uh, uh, all the animals are gone. The, uh, the, uh, the woods are, are sort of growing. It's, it's right in the Gatineau Park, basically. And uh, so the, the woods have grown right up to this few acres that my father uh, he's about 90 now or he's almost 90 now and he's got his lawn tractor and he he uh, he grooms the, the grass there's 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 like five acres of grass and he patches together the buildings and and fixes the tractor and and takes care of the place and we we visit every year uh, if we can but uh, but not this year so uh, and another important part about the place is up, up through the woods uh, into the Gatineau Park is uh, it's a short walk to uh, a lake called Pink, Pink Lake. And uh, every time we go back, we go up and make sure we walk around the lake as, as often as possible. Um, at one point, the farm extended to the lake and they would bring, so we, we sort of owned, owned part of the, the a part of the lake and they would bring the cows up there to drink and this is way in way far in the past and uh, and there's also a, a another important element is there's a, a log barn on near the house uh, where I grew up that's well over a hundred years old and uh, but at one point there are family stories that it was once way up we call it the mountain it's the Gatineau Hills way, way up the mountain and uh, it was brought down log by log and reassembled 
uh, near the house. So there's a long, long history. The lake and the farm kind of go together. Um, <clears throat> so for me, the place is about transformation and it's about stability. So the, uh, the, uh, the place is in flux, the buildings were, were moved around in the past, but for me, it's, it's been in the family for so long uh, that it, it, it's, and, and I connect with it. Uh, my, uh, my siblings connect with it, all of our children connect with it. So it's a very important place in, uh, for, for all of us. But the future of it's very uncertain because my, my, uh, my father and my, my aunts who own a little, uh, have a little cottage on the property, they, uh, they're all getting older. So we're not sure what's going to happen to the, to the property. So every time I go back, I take lo loads of, of photos and, uh, and then, um, uh, it's, I, um, I use, I, I'll, I'll talk about this soon that I'm going to be using, using some of these photos as, as sort of a jumping off point for the paintings in this show. Um, I want to talk about the title of the show. It's called, uh, Into This Mirror World. And it's also the title of this painting, but the painting's not, or wasn't in the show because I hadn't thought of it yet. Uh, when the show was first, <laughs> when the, the show was first installed. And into this mirror world uh, makes me think of sort of a few different things. And um, one, there's a sort of uh, mirroring that goes on in the painting process itself, in the composition and in the process of, of sort of making these paintings. Um, I begin, I usually begin a painting with, uh, with a digital painting. Um, so I, 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 I use photographic sources on the, on the computer and I, and I often will, will, will stretch images, reverse images, uh, uh, mirror the images, color, colorize them, stretch them, transparentize, flip them upside down, flip them back and forth. Um, so that's, that's one, one sense of, of, of mirror world in, in that there is that kind of uh, sort of mirroring and man manipulation, uh, when I'm, when I'm sort of using these images and, and, and thinking through them and working with them. Uh, and in this painting, you can see uh, along the, the tree line or on the shoreline next to the lake, there are sort of mirror, things that are mirrored on either side uh, that I somehow, sometime in the process of digital painting, I've been, I've been uh, sort of uh, flipping images. So uh, you can see a lot of sort of, uh, echoes from uh, across the, the painting. Plus there's the, the sky and the, and the water as sort of a mirror, a mirroring as well, vertically. Um, and uh, another, another thing that happens while I'm, I'm digital painting is that it, I, I, I get an image that's not, it's, it's, it's very far removed from my original photographs that I've been using. And I bring it to the studio, I work from the computer screen, and then I paint in oil uh, then I'll bring the painting at various stages, an image of it back in, back home, and then I'll sort of reintroduce it into the digital process and I'll, I'll work more with it that way. So it's very iterative. It, it involves this sort of, I call it digital painting. I'm not sure what else to call it because I sort of bring a lot of what I do um, in the studio. I sort of mimic those processes uh, digitally as well. Uh, with with the, the blurring and the and the, the um, using like cloning functions as a as a paintbrush and uh, it's it's uh, so so basically by the time I get to a, the, a painting it's gone through a, a, a really long iterative process that involves a lot of a lot of um, thinking and manipulating of the image. Um, so a second sense of, of of the mirror or the mirror world. Uh, that I like to think about is this mirroring um, of the, the specific place, mirroring uh, the world. It, it's acting as a microcosm of the world. It's a reflection of the world in a way, uh, metaphorically. So the, the world with all its tensions and darkness, but also the beauty in the world, the mystery, the wonder. Um, and I, I like to think of uh, Lewis Carroll's Alice Through the Looking Glass um, 
literally going into into a mirror world because that is a chance to uh, uh, sort of explore the whimsical, the uh, the uh, the strange, and uh, while at the same time being being a commentary really on 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 our world uh, metaphorically. Um, a third meaning of in the mirror world for me is that I'm taking a real place, my the place where I grew up, and then I'm sort of pulling it through uh, layers of my own experience. And I, I think of it as sort of holding the place up to like even a funhouse mirror that that distorts, that rearranges reality, that that uh, that changes it in a way. Um, and I think of it as distilling aspects of the place into a single image that is maybe more true or um, more about perception and experience and less about just, just a, a, single, a single moment. Um, and then it becomes what, what I've been referring to for the last few years as, as a no place. Um, I'm calling it that because uh, um, I, I've done a lot of reading and a lot of wor uh, work that sort of relates to utopias and dystopias. And uh, Thomas More's uh, book, Utopia, it was written in Latin. I never knew that. I read it and it said English translation. And I was wondering, he's English, why is there a translation? But he wrote it in Latin and the word utopia in Latin was a, was a pun. It was supposed to be really funny if you spoke Latin uh, because it, it, it could be translated as good place, but also as no place. And so I, I like the sort of tension between good place and no place. Um, where you're, we're always looking for that perfect place. And in my memory, this, 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 this farm where I grew up is, is like, is like a, um, a, a good place uh, for me and, 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 and my, my siblings and, and everybody that's connected with the family. And, but it's also a no place, uh, the way I've been painting it, because it's filtered through memory, through time, through all my other experiences of living across Canada. So um, it's, uh, it, it's got these, this sort of tension between, between good, this place that we would really want to be and then this sort of no place status. So I'd like to go back to some previous work that, that informed this work. And uh, this, what, this slide is um, a shot from uh, Comox Valley uh, Art Gallery in Courtney, where I had a show there with uh, Jeroen Wittvliet, a Victoria artist, uh, Jeroen Wittvliet. And that year, that was, that was 20, after my 2016 Elizabeth Greenshields grant that enabled me to, to sort of uh, to make that work. And it's centered on utopia and dystopia and the search for perfect happiness and the search for paradises on earth and, and human relationships to nature and the possible futures that we might want or not want. So in my reading, I, was, uh, I, I came across sort of two streams of utopian thought. Um, one, this sort of end of the 19th, 19th century view that technology, progress, modernism, technology will bring us a perfect society. We'll be living in glass cities and robots will serve us uh, food and, and we'll, we'll, be, we'll be happy. And, the, and there's, along with that, there was the, the opposite kind of view that, that all this technology is going to lead to trouble and we should just sort of go out of the cities and live, live in, 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 in the country and, and get closer to nature. And, that's, and that, that would be the ideal utopian state. So a lot of the paintings that I've, I've been, I've been uh, working with sort of play with this sort of um, uh, dual uh, goal or dual uh, stream of, of utopian thought of, of will technology be our route to happiness, or should we get really closer to nature? Uh, and the one novel that that I uh, that I really connected with the most was uh, Yevgeny Zamyatin's We W E, which uh, was the first dystopian novel 
of the 21st of the 20th century. It was written in 1921, which is a huge influence on George Orwell's 1984. 1984. He was accused of plagiarizing it even because they were so close, but he didn't plagiarize it. And um, Aldous Huxley's uh, Brave New World as well is a possible, was possibly influenced, heavily influenced by it. Um, so the title of this painting uh, that I'm showing is, is called In Marvelous Captivity. And I just wanted to take the opportunity here to, to, to mention that all the titles of, of the work that I'll be showing and most of the titles that I've, I've been using for the last four years have come from this book, um, this particular translation of We, um, and including the name of this show. And uh, Winchester has, has shown uh, a lot of his work uh, before. So uh, just uh, behind me right here in, in the gallery uh, in 2017, there, uh, they hung uh, this one called The uh, Ancient Sickness of Dreams. And I wanted to show you this one as, a, as because it, I think it sort of captures the essence of what I was trying to do in that there are markers of utopian thought um, and utopian thinking and also symbols of paradise, like the palm trees as a symbol of paradise, the, um, the, um, the, the modernist sort of architecture as this symbol of sort of technological progress and, and design and, and perfection. But I've got all these sort of animal headed creatures running around in this apocalyptic sky and, and these ruins in the background, so, and fire. So I'm, I was trying to create this, this tension between symbols of beauty and, and, and paradise on earth with these sort of dystopian elements. Um, so it, it gets a little apocalyptic sometimes. Um, and, and it makes, I often think of Paul Gauguin's uh, painting and the title of the painting, Where Do We Come From? what are we, where are we going? So I'm, I'm often thinking about this um, when, I'm, when, I'm, when I'm making these paintings. This is uh, more work at another show that Winchester, uh, uh, a solo show I had at Winchester in the downtown gallery when it was on Fort Street. And uh, the painting in the middle is called uh, Some Unknown Appointed Hour. And I wanted to show you this one because I, uh, another aspect of the paintings that I wanted to talk about is this sort of open-ended uh, nature of these, these narratives that are, that are sort of suggested. Um, and I really don't know what the paintings are. There's no, what they mean. There's no solid meaning. There's no final meaning. Uh, I have lots of ideas about what I think it means, but I really want the the viewer to sort of bring something to it. I was listening to a, um, a lecture by, uh, by Mark Mayer, the, uh, the uh, ex uh, head of uh, National Gallery of Canada. And he was talking about art, the role of art as being like a match. The, the art he said is the match and the viewer's mind is the cigar. So I thought that was really interesting because that's, that's what I think about a lot is how the painting is supposed to, for me, um, the intention is, is to, to, to start a sort of um, imaginative process in, in the viewer. Uh, that being said, I've got ideas about this painting that you could disagree with, but I've, to me, there, there's some kind of visitor that's, that sort of appeared on the shoreline and, 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 and there's something going to happen, something about to happen, something that is happening, people are arriving or they're leaving. And um, it definitely has, um, there, there's, there's some uh, symbolic connections in, uh, with color as well. I feel that what that yellow character comes from, from back there, from that yellow world across the water. Um, so this, that's background. Uh, this brings me to the, the current project. And I'm only showing you one photograph. Uh, I'm showing you mostly paintings, but I wanted to show you this photograph because 
it came from the last time I visited the, the farm and uh, I went for walks in the very early morning and, and just as the sun was going down with my cell phone, which is not a very good cell phone. It doesn't have a very good camera, but I, I went and walked around the whole uh, property uh, several times, just snapping picture after picture after picture. Um, and then when I got them, when I looked at them, I was really taken with the sense of motion, of, of, of movement, um, and um, what I uh, what I thought of was that it was there was this embodied sense of walking, um, and it had a, a very dreamlike quality. So that made me think. We were staying in, in my aunt's cottage, and this paint, this painting that I did in 2016, is uh, was sort of from the vantage point of that cottage, and there is there is this sense in the painting. Uh, there was in this one there was there was something more personal. It had to do with that place. So I thought of this painting, and I thought of these these photographs, and they came together, and that really made me uh, excited about making the work more personal. Um, so the, the, uh, the girl in the boat here is the same as the one in the painting that was at the beginning. It comes from an old family photograph. I think of her as, as uh, an Alice in Wonderland like figure. Um, the color of the barns are um, really tied to the, the memory of my, my, uh, my father painting the barns. When I was very small, I remember him painting the barns. He, he threw a whole bunch of, of, of red pigment into, into used engine oil, and then he painted all the barns with these. And of course, engine oil is not a, a drying oil, so, so there, that was like 40 years ago, and, and the paint is still not dry. When you walk up to the, the barns, you, the red comes off in your hand. Um, so all of those memories kind of converged, and uh, I brought the lake, the pink pink lake up the up the uh, the mountain down to the farm in this painting and in in, in, in uh, into this mirror world i brought the, the farm up to the lake so i'm starting to sort of merge uh, different aspects of the place together uh, along with with uh, old old family photographs my own photographs so this this is the first painting that i did in this series it's called uh, the world a thousand times faster and so what I wanted to capture with this was that, that rushing sense of motion um, and also the sort of merging of, of that feeling with old photographs. The, uh, the, uh, the tree in the background in this one uh, came from a photo, an old black and white photo uh, that I found. Um, of a tree that I remember that was hit by lightning and that's that's no longer there. So I'm sort of collapsing time in a way. Um, I'm, I'm I'm trying to uh, say, get the uh, this sense of uh, of, of rushing. Uh, the uh, the flowers come mostly it's a, they're a combination of of my experiences now in Victoria and the gardens that my mother and my aunts used used to uh, used to plant on the, on the farm. Uh, another merging of, of, of sort of time and space. Um, and I often use flowers to, to sort of counter any, uh, any sort of darkness in the painting. I'll bring flowers there too as, as, a, as a balance. And sometimes I put birds and deer and in the paintings and I, and I, I think of them as, as witnesses uh, to whatever might be happening. And I'm interested in skies. Uh, the, the, uh, they can add mystery, wonder, uncertainty. Um, there's something more cosmic about it. There's something about looking up at the sky um, um, that, that uh, creates some, some, some kind of uh, awe or unity. Um, and uh, compositionally, they create a harmony or a contrast in, in a painting. And uh, I've always connected with, 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 uh, with the sky in this particular uh, place. So this, uh, this painting 
is called uh, the sweet stinging cold fiery sparks again from we and um, I just want to mention that the the place where I grew up is really 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 dark at night there's no there's no um, there's surround there's forest all around there's no city nearby if uh, at one point you can climb the hill and see this the lights of Ottawa in the distance that's it was close enough to Ottawa that we could do that but uh, but basically it's really really pitch black and um, and so the sky is, is really, really a, a feature. Um, what, at, at night, you look up at the sky and the stars are extremely bright. Um, and a lot of my childhood memories revolve around this, this, this sense of the sky. Um, so in this painting, uh, I contrasted, the, the, there's, a, there's a contrast between the, the really fast areas where the, where the paint is, is, is really uh, quick and fast, and then kind of slower areas where that, that constellation is. The, the uh, um, and and to me that that there's there's sort of the, this again the sense of motion. Um, I really I, what I want to do with these paintings is to go beyond uh, what most photography does, where you take a single instant a, a, a photograph. It, it f photography can t can transcend this, but. But in general, a photograph is a is a is a is a snapshot of a, a split second, um, in at at, at in a pre, from a kind of frozen perspective. And David Hockney calls that looking at um, something like a paralyzed cyclops, a one-eyed you know frozen kind of view. Um, so the pros my, my process of painting of putting the painting together. Um, uh, even in the digital uh, phase is uh, very much about creating a sense of motion. And then when I get into the studio, uh, it's, a, it's a very bodily process. I've got very, very big brushes. I, 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 I rush at the canvas. I, uh, I've, I've got this, for my stars, I've got this long stick that I, and then I, I'm flinging, flinging stars at this thing. I'm letting the paint run. But then there's 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 areas of the painting that I that I that I slow down and I'm, I'm imagining it's mimicking the uh, the uh, the viewer's experience of looking at the painting. There's fast areas, there's slow areas. This uh, this painting, spreading the fragrance of grass, is linked. A lot of these are linked with specific memories or or, or started with a specific memory. So this one started with a memory of. Uh, looking up and seeing a sun dog and not knowing what it was for the first time and then going into the basement and getting my father's welding mask and lying in the grass and looking up at this this sun dog combined with uh, ideas or, or memories of of the uh, when all the snow melts and the, the streams would come down the hill and we would have to often go up and and divert the stream so it wouldn't go into the house um, I'm also interested in this idea of indeterminate time. So uh, often uh, I'll have sort of a sunlit grass and then sort of a night sky. So it's, uh, it came out of the idea of these dawn and dusk cell phone photos that were sort of, you, you couldn't tell what time of day it was. Um, and this, this, is, this painting is, is associated with a, a childhood memory of looking up at, at, at the night sky and noticing for the first time that the night sky could be blue um, because kids think in binaries, night, night is black and day is light, but sometimes there's in between states. Um, this one is called uh, Laughter Can Be of Different Colors. And uh, it also comes, sort of comes from a memory of, of looking up in, in, at the north and seeing these very tiny, tiny northern lights and then wondering what it would be like if I really went up north and saw those northern lights for real. And then I lived in Alberta for 15 years and, uh, and in the northern lights often were just spectacular. So this is an idea. Uh, this is a way of, of sort of um, condensing my, my personal experience, the, the, the experience of, of the place, of memory, but also other experiences of place that I've had across the country. 
Um, this one has a, a little bit more of that, that, that sense of whimsy and um, there's a snail in it. And the, uh, uh, I wanted to talk about how that happened because it's, it is, I think, important to the, the, to the sort of process of painting. Um, there, were, there were sort of these bushes that seemed animate. There's a couple of bushes there that seem like they're almost moving. And as I was painting the one on, 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 on the left, it started to resemble the, the shape of a snail. So I just decided to, to fully transform it. So there's this, again, there's this theme of transformation, but also of playfulness that I think, that I, think uh, I wanted to come through in this. This painting is called The Uncanny, Intolerably Bright, Black Starry Sunny Night. And it's bigger than the others. Uh, I wanted to show you this just to talk about scale. Um, uh, I wanted this one to be a little bit more epic. Uh, it's about, what, 76 by 58 inches. And most of the other paintings about, are about four, four feet by five feet. Big enough, I think, that the viewer can sort of feel this sort of, uh, feel that they're inside it a little bit. Um, and feel a connection with it uh, physically in a space, but this 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 larger one is 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 a lot more sort of um, engaging, and it's got this tension between beauty and darkness. And I, when I painted this, I started to think of all these paintings as sort of uh, farm noir or uh, Canadian farm gothic. Uh, there. Uh, and all of those have a bit of that quality, but this, this one ended up being a little bit more apocalyptic than I, than I had uh, expected. Uh, part of that is um, that the horses that are galloping uh, sort of towards the viewer weren't actually intended to be in the painting. They were part of, a, of an older painting that I had not finished. It wasn't quite working. I liked the horses, but I didn't like anything else. So I plan a new painting and I hardly ever do this. I, I usually start from scratch, but in this one, I decided that I would paint over top of another painting. And then the horses started to sort of emerge in just the right spot. And, and I decided to, to bring them out again. Um, and the little figure at the bottom comes from another old, family photograph uh, that was damaged. And uh, I, was, I always was intrigued by it because because this little boy in it uh, always looked to me like he had wings. So I, I decided to, to go with that as well. So it's sort of the process of painting that, that sometimes brings out these sort of symbolic uh, um, characteristics. This is called uh, In Perfect Rhythm, Down, Down, Down. And this I'm featuring in, in this the house that I grew up in. And I'm drawing on memories of family fireworks on Canada Day where my father would go out and we'd light sprinklers and my father would end the, the evening with a, a, a big rocket. One was called Big Bertha, I, I remember. And um, Again, there's, 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 there's many flung stars. And the, again, uh, the moon comes from my, out my, my apartment window in Victoria. So there's this merging of, of, of my visual experience now, my memories and photographs of, of, of the place and uh, lots of invention and lots of sort of imaginative uh, elements. This one, Blessedly Blue Sky, Tiny Baby Suns, is um, the result of merging one of my cell phone photos that had all the, the motion in it with this 1970s photo of, 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 the, uh, of the barn that was very, very, a little bit overexposed, sat, uh, really saturated colors. So there's time collapsing here 
there's the merging of the new, the new and the old, but the, the, the sort of stability of this, of this, of this structure that's kind of always been there. And um, combining that with this sort of stormy sky, active stormy sky. And I've exaggerated the tilt of the hill. The, the idea here, again, going back to the, this idea of metaphor and the sort of um, microcosm using this particular place as a metaphor for the, for, uh, the, the world at large. To me, this represents sort of the stability um, in, in with, with, with all this sort of maelstrom of, of activity going around. So it's, it's, um, it's kind of talk, talking a little bit about what's happening in the world to, to me, uh, uh, symbolically. And uh, this, this painting, um, Some Joy Awaited Tomorrow, I wanted to just talk about, again, the process of painting where quite often what I end up painting is not what, it, what I thought I would get. So I, I, this, this painting started with, 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 with a dream, the first dream I, I, I ever remember having, which involved the barns. There were other elements. It was very, it was very complex. And as, as I got to the studio and as I got painting, the very complex ideas started to break down. And I started to realize that the focus of this painting is for, for me, the, the deer in the background, this little, this little element in the background that started to become what the painting was about. So I started to strip all sorts of uh, other elements out of it and, uh, and then ended up this with, 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 with an entirely different focus. And with this painting, swiftly down the current light, um, I, I think it ended up being extending this idea of indeterminate time, is it day, is it night, uh, to is it winter, is it, is it spring? I, uh, I started to, to, end, uh, to, to sort of put a lot of the, these expressive lights into, into the tree and it started to look like snow or Christmas lights or something. Uh, and yet, and yet the, uh, there's grass and flowers and uh, people in Victoria might think that's normal, but back, back east, they're, they're, it's very unusual to have snow on trees and, and with flowers on the, on the ground. Um, it makes me think of ice storms, uh, which are really common back in that area as well. So again, I'm sort of collapsing night, day, um, different seasons uh, in, into one painting. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that I wanted to sort of focus on in this painting is the entranceway into the woods, which if you look on the right of that, that small building, that sort of dark hole, that is the way up to Pink Lake. Uh, so, uh, and uh, it's, uh, as, a, as a kid, it was kind of scary. The woods were scary. And even now it, it's so dark there that going into the woods at night is, 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 is often, it's pretty unthinkable and there are bears. So I thought I would just end the slides with uh, a view of my studio, just to show uh, a little bit about the process. Uh, I've got the computer up there on my makeshift stand, my, uh, my oil painting rig there that I can, I can roll around and, and pull it back from the painting so I can work and look at, at a distance. I usually work on the wall there and I keep paintings on sort of on the go around me while I'm painting. So, so I, I can take elements from, from, from certain paintings, things that I like in a particular painting. I, I keep it visible while I'm painting something new. And, uh, and that's it. So thank you for listening to my talk. And we're going to just walk around uh, just to have a look at the space here.
and uh, Anahita is going to hold up the, the laptop. I just have a few other things that I was saving just because as I was talking about scale, hope everyone can hear me now. So as I was, this is long, so let's, this can work. So just so you can see the painting in, on a wall instead of uh, not in a digital image. Um, and I just wanted to maybe just talk about some of the elements that, I, that are, I've been talking about, the, the sort of the, the physicality of the paint, uh, the, uh, the large the large sort of brush strokes, the, um, the indeterminate time, is this, is this it, it, it seems like it's day, is it night, there, are those northern lights, what are they? Um, and slow areas and fast areas um, that, that I'm, I'm really, I'm really interested in, 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 in how that is seen by the viewer because uh, for me, uh, a lot of the larger quick areas are painted very, very quickly, but then something like these, these little figures or this, 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 this snail is where I will slow down and I will, I will take a lot of time and um, And it, it provides it provides a focus. It provides a, a sort of a um, a way of thinking about about the paint and the material qualities of the paint for me. Um, and in this one, I just wanted to mention that in uh, the painting the painting that I did in that, that was sort of an inspiration for this for this series. Uh, now inside the mirror with the uh, the girl on the boat. Uh, I actually brought that particular lake, the purple lake, uh, down down to a different part of 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 of, of, of the property, uh, where where it was originally Pink Lake, and then I was I, I brought it, I painted it into another part, and now I've, I've used it here. Um, and the reason the reason was that as as I was interested in having this being the focus of the painting, I wanted some kind of way to project the, the, the viewer's attention into the painting. So you, you sort of skip over this and then you're sort of launched into the mid-ground. Uh, the height of these buildings end up end up sort of pinning in and, and, and directing attention uh, to, to this, this figure as, as well. Plus, plus the water again mirrors mirrors the sky and, and, and provides sort of this sort of um, a more interesting division of this, this sort of squarish canvas, uh, just sort of compositionally speaking. And uh, and for this one, I uh, as I was thinking about what I wanted to say, I remembered uh, when I was 14, I was taking my first art class at the Auto School of Art, and uh, I was a very immature artist. I, I wanted to sort of copy an album cover. It was, uh, it was a uh, crime of the century by the super Tramp, and it had all sorts of stars on it. Uh, there was these hands and bars and, and, and the, uh, the painting instructor, I, I was like painting every little star and the painting instructor said, why don't you just get a toothbrush and dip it in, dip it in paint and flick it. And I was appalled. I thought, what? That's too easy. And, and, <laughs> I did it, and 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 it worked. And then, uh, being an immature artist, I uh, what, what I think of as immature, I I now realize that that working with the material qualities of the paint, and working with the viscosity, and working with with bodily motions, and 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 and, and processes is is where the real painting is, you know, for me. So I, I thought it was very funny uh, thinking back to you know me as, as not even, well, I didn't even really become an artist until I was 30 anyway, but back when I was 14, just, just, just how shocked I was that this, 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 this seemed too easy. It turns out it's not really that easy either. 
Um, we could look at those, or I don't know if you want to. Can you? I got, I got my crew. I got my crew. Um, yeah, I just I just wanted to sort of remind remind, uh, remind you about the utopian and dystopian tensions, which I think are in, in still in, in, in the paintings on the farm. Uh, sort of darkness, light, um, and in this one in particular, I think it it, it helps to uh, to sort of illustrate. Um, this tension between technological and and, uh, and 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 natural utopian sort of uh, ideas. So this this has all these sort of natural forms, and then these sort of um, structured rows of houses are sort of imposed in, into this landscape. Um, and so so there's there's a beauty, and there, there and there's also the, the tension as well. And it's again it's 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 questioning what, what kind of future, what, what is a perfect place? What is a good place? What kind of future do we want? What, 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 kind, of, uh, what kind of future do we not want? And I guess finally, I could be able to look at it back. This is called uh, Our Glass Paradise, which was the name of my show uh, at Winchester Modern. And um, again, um, for me, there, 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 there is, there, there, it's about the beauty, it's about the good place. Uh, this, this was taken from a different, couple of different photographs that I, that I took in, in Mexico City, outside of Mexico City. So this, this, is, this is another very specific place. And this was taken uh, partly from a photo that I took out of the bus window on the way to the pyramids north, north of, the, of the city. And I just noticed that all the houses were, were, were crowded up on, the, on this hill. And it, and it seemed to me that it must be such a great place and must, must be such a great view. Everyone wants to be there. Um, but then they were so crowded together that I wasn't sure uh, if it was such a, 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 a beautiful, great place to be. But obviously it's, 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 it's very, uh, very prestigious up on, up on the hill kind of uh, uh, placement of, of these, these buildings. And, and I sort of put this implied beach in, 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 in the foreground to give, to give them something beautiful to look at. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, I think that's all I've got to say. Uh, do you want to, yeah, do you want to look at, see if anybody had any questions? Okay, I can read read your questions. So I have to say that it's 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 really hard to talk to to an audience that I can't see. Uh, so I was, <laughs> it was uh, you know nobody's laughing at my jokes. Um, so um, I have a question. I'm interested in how you came to choose the color palette you use currently, and who are the painters that inspire you. Uh, I like to use a very limited color palette for the most part. I, I, uh, I think I can create almost anything I want from maybe five, five pigments, that's it. Uh, sometimes I'll bring in a couple of more if, 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 if it's necessary uh, or if I feel it's necessary, but most of the time I just stick with the uh, ultramarine blue. Um, uh, I use a, a, a quinacridone magenta uh, from Michael Harding, which is an amazing pigment. I use this really, uh, also Michael Harding uh, Yellow Lake, which is uh, uh, really powerful. Uh, burnt sienna, and then just uh, white. I like using uh, either a real flake white or uh, Gamblin's flake white replacement. Um, a little bit of uh, phthalo blue if I need it. 
and I never find I, I, uh, I have a need to use anything else. I can get almost anything I want from these, these very few pigments. Uh, as far as uh, artists that I, I, I like, uh, going back historically, I can go to Velasquez, Rembrandt, um, uh, to the 20th century, I can go to um, uh, Lucian Freud, uh, just, you know, the big names. They're big names for a reason. Um, and, I, uh, and I like Peter Doig uh, a lot. Uh, Hervin Anderson, uh, this guy in, in Australia called Adam Lee. He's, I really like him. Um, uh, Dana Schutz from uh, Brooklyn, uh, Jules de Ballancourt from Brooklyn. Uh, lots of things come to mind, but. Um, so, let's see what other questions. I get, so Barbara says, should I say the names? Maybe not. I get a wonderful sense of nostalgia and longing in your work. Could you please, um, could you speak to this please? Well, nostalgia, it's my, that's where I grew up. It's, it's really about this yearning for the good place. And nostalgia is, I didn't use the word nostalgia, um, but it's, it's, it's definitely there in, in a good sense, nostalgia in a, in a good sense. I, I feel very strongly about the subject matter here and I feel very strongly about what I'm trying to say about the subject matter here. It's, it's, it's very deeply personal for me, actually uh, more than ever uh, in, than in all the paintings I've ever done in the last 25 years. Uh, these paintings are the most personal to me and, uh, and but they also uh, speak to the language of paint and contemporary painting as well. So uh, yeah, uh, nostalgia is uh, in that sense. And uh, where do you see the future of your art? What are your long-term goals in your career? I am going to keep painting a lot. <laughs> And I'm not going to stop. Uh, it's um, I, 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 when I started painting, I just knew that that's what I was going to do, and then I, I, I've never I've never paused, and I've always it's always been a full time job to me, and uh, um, even uh, and and now I just I, I just feel like I. I, I don't know what the world, how the world will receive it. Um, I think it's worthwhile doing and I, and I really feel it's what I meant, I'm meant to be doing and I'm just going to keep doing it no matter what happens. So that's my goal. <laughs> um, so what tools do you use besides brushes or only brushes? Let's see, gotta see this. And have you changed the types of tools you paint with? Um, I use bristle brushes, um, big wide hog hair brushes uh, that are, or spalter brushes, um, four inches wide, three inches wide. I do most of my work with that. Uh, small, uh, I have a little, small sable brushes for anything I need to do tiny work with and I have my favorite brushes and I, I and I, I just use them um, consistently and I have been using these big drywall painting knives like a 12 inch wide drywall painting knife sometimes to uh, and really attack the paint um, that's that's new actually funny you should ask but that that is new um, where I'll, I'll just pile on a whole bunch of paint and in and, and, and different layers, and then I'll, I'll drag the, the, uh, the drywall knife through it. And uh, that, get, that, that can take paint away and, and put it on in a very interesting way. And then the, uh, the brush on the stick where I, uh, where I fling, I fling the, uh, the paint, that's, that's fun. And that's new too, I haven't done that before. And is that it?
Okay, good. So I think that's all the questions. And it's like, oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay, good. We got a uh, great talk. Much appreciated. That's nice. And it's four minutes to four. So that means it's an hour. So that was good timing, right? Um, all right, good. So, uh, Jeff. Neil, thank you. And thank you all of you for coming out this afternoon and being with us uh, at Winchester. Um, Neil, it was great to hear you speak. Uh, Anahita and myself, we spent a lot of time, you know, gazing upon your campuses and you know, your description of the, the, the intimacy of it. And um, uh, the familial involvement, your memory and uh, all of that, and the stars and toothbrushes. <laughs> Uh, for us, it uh, it really it re really gels, and we'd like to invite you in to have a personal investigation of Mr. McClellan's works. Uh, we're here in the gallery, uh, keeping somewhat reduced hours from uh, eleven till three, Tuesday through Saturday, and uh, all the work that Neil has discussed uh, can be made available to you if uh, you want to approach us uh, in that regard. So. We may see you again in the future, uh, utilizing this format to bring yourselves in with us and uh, allow me a brief moment to introduce Miss Anahita Ranjbar, my colleague, who makes this all possible uh, as the technical wizard here at the um, gallery. Well, I'd like to thank um, Mr. McClelland and uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Dean here, and thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Oh, you stay well and take good care out there, okay? Thank you. Bye.